get to spend some time singing together. It's good to get to spend some time in God's Word together. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 22, or we're going to start there. So go ahead and find your way to Genesis chapter 22. Uh, we're starting a new series today called Christ Before Christmas. So we're going to be journeying through the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures and understanding what the Hebrew Scriptures teach us about the Messiah that was to come. Uh, so I want to ask you as you're turning there to Genesis 22, uh, what are your Christmas plans? Now, uh, I don't want to cause anybody any uh, unnecessary anxiety, and I want to tell you that at our house, uh, we have just a general rule that we don't do Christmas before Thanksgiving. I mean, Thanksgiving needs to have its day, and so we don't do decorations. We, we have one, one uh, exception to that. Uh, is that we, we start watching Christmas movies a little earlier than Thanksgiving. There's just too many good Christmas movies to get through between Thanksgiving and Christmas, so we watch a, a few Christmas movies. But we really try to let Thanksgiving have its day. Uh, but this year, I, I see us sprinting to Christmas as a nation, as a community, as a church. And, and so I see us running ahead to Christmas. So that's why we're starting a little early this year with Christ Before Christmas. Because here's the Christmas that I see us sprinting towards. I see us sprinting towards the plans that we make for Christmas, our time together with family, the gifts that we might buy. And so when you think about your Christmas plans, I want you to think, you know, uh, look a month and a half out or so, what are you going to be doing? Where are you going? Whose house are you going to first? Those of you with young kids especially, like how are you going to make the rotation? Are you going to do the thing this year where you say, hey, y'all know where we're going to be. If you want to come, you know, we'll be right here. Good luck with that, by the way. Uh, it's really nice if you can pull it off. Uh, but are you traveling after Christmas? Probably some of your Christmas plans are up in the air. I mean, after all, we're a month and a half out of Christmas. Pastor, you're putting a lot of pressure on me to have it all planned out. Ladies, do you have your menus planned out? Guys, if you're going to do some kind of grilling event, like do you know what you're going to do? Hey, Pastor, listen, Thanksgiving's not even here. You're putting a lot of pressure on me. Well, here's what I want us to see in today's message. I want us to see in today's message, that is, we're a month and a half out from our celebration of Christmas, and we know that our plans are not quite yet nailed down. Do you know that 2,000 years ago, God accomplished what he intended to in Christmas? Do you know that about 1,500 years before that, God started telling us what his plans were for Christmas? And about 500 or so years before that, God started weaving into the story of the human experience, what he was going to do through Christmas. In other words, God has known what his Christmas plans were even before the world began. And we're going to see that unpacked for us in the Old Testament as we journey through these next few weeks, Christ before Christmas. What do we see in Scripture about the coming Messiah before we even get to the birth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1? Now, we're not going to, in this series, look at specific prophecies, although we could. Over 300 specific prophecies about the coming Messiah. It's like dialing a telephone number. You remember uh, uh, back when, when you would actually pick up a phone, and you would have to dial. And if you were outside of the country, you'd have to dial a 1 to get into the United States of America. Then you would dial an area code, and that narrows it down a little more. And then you would dial a local number, which back in those days, most everybody had uh, one local extension. And then you would dial those last four digits that would get you to the specific house. And then when the phone picks up, it's not like today. You're not calling a person. You're calling a house. And you don't know who's going to answer on the other end of the line. If there's five people in the house, it could be anybody who picks up the phone. And so you, then you need to ask, can I speak to this specific person? Well, that's really what the Hebrew Scriptures do for us. One at a time, one prophecy at a time, 300 numbers, if you will. And by the end we get to the time we get to the end of all 300 of those prophecies, the only person who can pick up the phone is Jesus. There's only one person in the history of the world that fits everything the Old Testament says about the coming Messiah. And these are not obscure details. In fact, I've given you a list right there. The Bible in the Old Testament tells us where the Messiah would be born. The Bible tells us where he, when he would live. The Bible tells us how he would be born. The Bible tells us who he would descend from. The Bible tells us he would be poor and marginalized. The Bible tells us how he would enter Jerusalem. The Bible tells us who would oppose him. The Bible tells us, uh, down to the number, how much he would be betrayed for. The Bible tells us that he would die. The Bible tells us how he would die. The Bible tells us where he would be buried. The Bible tells us that he would be raised from the dead. And the Bible tells us that he would ascend to the right hand of God all before Matthew chapter 1. 
So there's no mistake, there's no mistaking anyone else for the Messiah other than Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can fit the bill. In fact, the time for the Messiah's birth has come and gone. It was 2,000 years ago. Jesus is the only one who could be the predicted Messiah. But what I want us to do in this sermon series is not to look so much at how we would prove that Jesus is the Messiah, but to go back to these ideas and these typologies that God has given us in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, that teach us these deep and great truths about Christmas and about the coming Messiah. And so what we're going to do today in Genesis chapter 22 as we begin is we're going to start with this idea that Christmas is full of hope because Jesus took our place. Christmas is full of hope because Jesus took our place. And you know what? I have a deep concern. Is I love Christmas, and I love all, everything around Christmas. I mean, I love Christmas lights. I love Christmas food. I love Christmas cookies. And I love Christmas cookies ice cream. Those are two different things. I love them both. I love Christmas parties. I love being at my family's house. I love giving gifts. I love receiving gifts. I love everything about the way we celebrate Christmas. But here's what I see, especially this year in 2020, is we are sprinting to Christmas because we don't like the year that we're living in. We want this year to be over. And so we're trying to get to Christmas as fast as we can, and we're hopeful about Christmas, and we're hopeful that Christmas is going to somehow fix what's broken right now or fix what's wrong with us. But here's the thing. As we move towards it, we're putting our hope in all the stuff around Jesus. And we're not really putting our hope in the only place we're going to find hope, which is Jesus himself. So we want to go back and we want to dig deep and we want to see what exactly was Christmas designed to be, the coming of Jesus to earth. Christmas is full of hope because Jesus took our place. Ladies, Christmas is not full of hope because Hallmark movies, uh, Hallmark Christmas movies are now playing around the clock, all right? Guys, Christmas is not full of hope because on the other side of Christmas is the best deer season of the year, okay? All right, Christmas is full of hope because Jesus took our place. 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus, God established this pattern, this pattern of substitutionary sacrifice, this pattern that says something will take the place of God's people. 2,000 years ago, we want to rewind all the way to Genesis chapter 22. We don't know exactly when Abraham lived. Moses wrote this down around 1,500 years before Jesus was born. If you can wrap your minds around that. I mean, what were you doing in the year 500, all right, Uh, 1,500 years ago? Well, 1,500 years before Jesus was even born, God had Moses write this down and tell us this story. And somewhere around 500 to 1,500 years before Moses wrote it down is when it happened. We don't know the exact timeline. We're just guessing here. But let me put it this way. It was a long time ago, and it was a long time before Jesus was born. And if we can imagine somehow, some way, that something that happened in 500 AD somehow had a predictive prophetic role in what's going on in 2020, then we can begin to grasp the scope and the breadth with which God pre-planned Christmas and laid it all out for us to show us what he would do through the Messiah. Because somewhere around 2,000 years before Jesus was born, God spoke to a Bedouin sheep, a Bedouin shepherd, and said, Genesis 22, 1, Take your son, your only son whom you love, and offer him on the mountain that I will show you. So Abraham, being obedient to God, takes Isaac, and he goes on a three-day journey. And over three days, God leads him to the region of Moriah, they get to the region of Moriah, and God, we don't, the text doesn't tell us how, but somehow God identifies to him which mountain it is that he wants him to make this sacrifice on. And Abraham says to his servants who've traveled with him, hey, Isaac and I are going to go up on the mountain, and we're going to worship. It's the first time in Scripture the word worship is used. We're going to worship. Now think about that. I'm going up on the mountain to offer my son, and Abraham identifies it as an act of worship, an act of sacrifice. And, and you think, well, my goodness, that, That's an amazing statement to make. He makes an even more amazing statement. In fact, he says to them when he's down on the bottom of the mountain, he says, the boy and I are going to go up there and worship, and then we're coming back. Statement of faith. 
Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that Abraham trusted so much that God would be good to his promise and true to his word that he believed God could even raise the dead, that God would raise his dead son, from, uh, son Isaac from the dead if needed. Why? Because God had made a promise to Abraham. A promise that through Abraham all the nations of the world would be blessed, that Abraham would become a great nation, that his descendants would be like the stars of the heavens and the sand of the sea. And he had made that promise through Isaac. God had said, in fact, at one point, Abraham asked that it be through Ishmael, and God said, no, it will not be through Ishmael, it will be through Isaac. And Abraham had grown to be such a man of faith that he knew God was the God of his word. And he knew that, there, that nothing could happen to Isaac because all the promises of God were wrapped up in Isaac. And that to sacrifice Isaac, to take Isaac's life, would be to sacrifice all the promises that God had made. So Abraham makes this incredible statement of faith. The boy and I are going to go worship, and then we'll come back. Then Isaac and his father walk up the mountain. And Abraham makes another incredible statement of faith. Isaac says, Father, we have the wood, we have the fire. But where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says to his son Isaac, Isaac, God himself will provide a ram for the sacrifice. Where the Bible says that Abraham and Isaac continued their journey up to the top of the mountain. Abraham built an altar. This was not a quick thing. It took him three days to get there, and then they have to build an altar. When they get up there, he binds his son. He lays him on top of the altar. He takes out the knife. He draws the knife in the air. And when the knife is about to come down onto Isaac, not just his son, but all of the promises of God wrapped up in a person, and understand, not just the promises of God wrapped up in a person for Abraham, but as the Jewish people were reading this for the first time, it's the promises of God wrapped up for them. This is their ancestor. If this boy dies on that altar, then they do not exist. And so their very existence is all on the line in this moment. And just as the knife is about to come down, God calls out to him. And that's where we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 10, the Bible says this, Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand upon the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. So understand with God's people, everything on the line, God delivered his people. How did he do it? In that moment, he did it through a substitute. Something took the place of God's people, and that something was a ram that was caught in the thicket. So the pattern is established. 2,000 years before Jesus is born, the pattern is established. 1,500 years before Jesus is born, the story is written down. And then the Jewish people, as they read this story, understand something of their history. And here they are in the land of Egypt, and they're coming out of the land of Egypt. And no doubt, they know this story. They've heard this story. And Moses says, it's time to go. It's time to leave Egypt. And God's going to perform one last plague. He's going to judge Egypt in one last way. What is that plague going to be? But the death of the firstborn, Exodus is chapter 12. So the death of the firstborn of all of the land, except, with one exception, those who will take a Passover lamb and kill this lamb and take its blood and put it over the doorpost. Otherwise, every household, the firstborn son will die. What is the firstborn son but the promise of God passing on through his people to the next generation, his goodness and his covenants and his promises? So here, once again, the people of Israel, their future existence is on the line. Every firstborn son is destined to die. The destroyer is coming, and he is coming to take the life of every firstborn son. And Moses gathers the people together, and he says, here's what God's told us, Exodus chapter 12. Go and select lambs for yourself according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin, 
touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door or out of his house till morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Israel, your life is on the line again. But once again, there is a substitute. And if you will take that lamb, and that lamb must die in order for you to be saved. So the Jewish people hear this great story of Abraham and Isaac, and they realize that before they were even a nation, that God took a sacrifice, a substitute, and put it in their place. And then here they are, walking out of the nation of Israel, this last moment, this last stronghold that Pharaoh has on the Jewish people. He won't let them go, but this last plague is going to do it. And how does God do it? He does it by sending a substitute for the people of Israel. This lamb will stand in your place. This lamb will die instead of you. And then they walk out into the wilderness and they meet with God at Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, God gives the law. And in the law, he sets up the sacrificial system. In the sacrificial system, you probably know something of it. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you probably know something of it. It's where you take an animal and you offer it as a sacrifice and your sins are forgiven. That's the basic idea of it. But there's so much more to the sacrificial system. Uh, There's communion with God. When you offer a lamb as a sacrifice or a bull or a goat as a sacrifice, then that part of that meat is cooked and you have a meal with God. It's a sign that your, your fellowship with God is restored. And so you eat a little bit of it, the priests eat a little bit of it, and it's a sign of fellowship with God. It's a reminder that, that the wages of sin is death. But don't miss that it's also a substitute. In fact, Leviticus chapter 1 tells us that when you come in the very beginning of the book of Leviticus, and Leviticus is like a handbook for priests. How do you make these sacrifices? How do you do everything the way God has asked you to do it? In the very first chapter of of Leviticus, the Bible says that when you come to the tent of meeting, when you come to offer your sacrifice and you offer it, it's for your atonement. It's taking your place. It's standing in where you should be. In other words, you should be paying for your sins. You should be on the altar. You should be paying with your life. Your blood should be shed, but instead of you, it will be an animal. A substitute will take your place. Then we fast forward to Leviticus chapter 16, the most important day in the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur in Leviticus chapter 16 is detailed. It's the day of atonement. It's the day when all the sins of all the people. So so any other day, you come and you make a sacrifice for your sins. But on this day, this sacrifice represents all the people. In fact, Aaron uh, or his sons or the priests that would come after them has to make a specific sacrifice for himself. He's got to be right before God. And he goes through an elaborate ritual before he can even offer this sacrifice because this is for all the people to pay for the sins of all the people. And all the people should die. All the people have sin. And they should all die. But God says, no, on this one day, I will take this sacrifice, and it will take your place. And instead of your death, the animal will die, and the animal will take your place, and the blood of that animal will pay for your sins. But there's another animal on Yom Kippur, Leviticus chapter 16. There's two goats. The first one is the goat who is offered on the altar as a sacrifice. The second one is a scapegoat. The scapegoat is... The goat that the priest would pull in, and he would confess the sins of the people, and he would hold the head of the goat, symbolically transferring the sins of the people to the goat. And then they would take the goat, and they didn't offer it on the altar as a sacrifice. No, they sacrificed it in somewhat of a different way. They put it outside of the camp. God was clear in the law that if you had specific sins, or you weren't right with God, or your life wasn't holy enough, then you had to be outside of the camp. You, had, you could not be inside of the camp. And so on this one day, instead of all the people being cut off from the camp, cut off with fellowship from one another, and don't forget that the tabernacle, the presence of God, is right in the center of the camp. So when you're outside of the camp, you're cut off from the presence of God. So on this one day, instead of the people being punished by being cut off from the fellowship of God and his people for forever, all of those sins are transferred to this goat. And this goat, you just take him out and you release him out into the wilderness. Some scholars believe that in that way he would be eaten by a wild animal, he'd be destroyed, and in that way he he, he actually died as well. Other people say, no, it's just that he was cut off from the community and he's forced now to wander out, disconnected from God and his people. He has to make his own way. But either way, we see on Yom Kippur this idea that it is the people who should die, It's the people who should be cut off from the fellowship of God. But God says, no, there's a substitute 
Something is going to take your place. Then we move forward to the prophets. The prophets begin to see with more clarity how these typologies, these symbols, how they make sense in God's big picture. God begins to reveal to them how this all works with God's big plan. Because let's be honest, we know. Can an animal's blood really pay for our sin? Is there any way that, that an animal's blood could actually do anything to somehow make me right with God? And I mean, let's not even think about the scapegoat. How does that work? I mean, can you imagine you come home and, and your kids have destroyed the house? I mean, it's bad. They've got markers and paint. They put some holes in the wall. I mean, it is really bad. They've, just, they've gone after all the candy that they're not supposed to eat. I mean, it's just been a day full of sin for your kids. And you come home and, I mean, you're, you're, you're ticked. And you start thinking about all the, all, everything's going to happen. You're taking away this. You're taking away that. They're going to be grounded to their 45. You know, this and that. They're not going to college anymore. You know, it's whatever. You, everything. You're mad. The kids say, don't worry. And they bring your cat in. They just put their hands on its head, and they just start confessing all their sins. Yeah, we stole the candy. We got the paint out. We, we put holes in the wall. We, we did what we weren't supposed to. We did all that. And then they just drop the cat off in the neighbor's yard and say, don't worry, Mom and Dad. It's all good. We're good. Well, no, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, that didn't do anything. That didn't take your sin away. Your sin is still here. So as God's people walking through all these rituals, God, why are you having us kill this innocent lamb who did nothing and put his blood over our door? Lord, why did you have us do that? Why couldn't you just pass over us? You know we're faithful. You know those who trust you and those who don't. Why not just pass over us? God, why not just take our, our prayer as, as our sin? Why, not, why, why do we have to kill these animals? Why? I mean, think about it. Day after day after day, priest offering sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. For 1,500 years, every day, animals killed, blood is spilled. Historians tell us that by the, day, the time of Jesus, on the Day of Atonement, there would be maybe millions of lambs that were killed on that day for individual sins, and then the nation would offer one for the sacrifice of the people. Think about all those animals year after year, day after day. Lord, why put us through these rituals? It's because 2,000 years before Jesus was born, God set up a pattern of substitutionary sacrifice, and then Isaiah picks up on it. And as Isaiah describes God's servant, the Messiah, the coming Messiah, some 500 years before Jesus would be born. Isaiah describes him this way in chapter 53. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace. He is going to be punished for our sin, that our punishment is placed on him. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. So 500 years before Jesus is born, Isaiah says the coming Messiah is going to be like a lamb. He's going to be like a lamb that is killed. He's going to be like a lamb that is killed, and he's killed because our punishment is on him. In other words, he is going to take our place. In just a few weeks, we'll dive into Isaiah 53. And you'll see that all throughout Isaiah 53, he builds up this idea that the servant will take our punishment on him. He calls this servant a lamb 2,000 years before Jesus was born, God set this pattern up of substitutionary sacrifice. And then, 2,000 years before you and I were born, Jesus became our substitutionary sacrifice. Don't miss it. And don't miss the incredible mind of God as he plans out every unfolding act of history. There is no accident in the history of the world. There is only God's sovereign plan unfolding just as he deems it should unfold. And so God brings Abraham up to that hill. God stops his hand. God plans the Passover. God plans the Exodus. God executes that plan perfectly. God lays out the sacrificial system. God builds it all. Why? To teach us this truth that for God's people, there will be a substitute to take their place. And then we come to the New Testament, and we see it begin to unfold in the life of Jesus in a way that no one, no one, no one saw. No one put all the pieces together. 
In fact, it wasn't until Jesus raised from the dead, pulled his disciples together, and said, let me show you how all of the scriptures, all of the Hebrew scriptures have been pointing to me the whole time. Let me show you how this is all laid out. And then they, in the New Testament, in turn, take what Jesus taught them in those 40 days, and they show us how it was all there all along. We couldn't see it. We couldn't understand it. And so don't think that people were walking around at the time before Jesus saying, oh, I see how this fits together in the Messiah. No, it it wasn't until Jesus, the missing puzzle piece, came into place that we were able to step back and go, that's how it all fits together. And we see it perfectly coming together in the person and work of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us about all those sacrifices made year after year, the priest making sacrifices day after day. And he says this, the author of Hebrews says, that, that can never take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. But, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 10, when Christ had offered for all a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Don't miss the picture the author of Hebrews is giving us of the, Hebrew, of the priest day after day doing his work doing his work day after day. He's got more work to do. He, he goes to work one day. He makes sacrifices for this person's sin and that person's sin. He goes through all the rituals. He does everything he needs to do. He works all day long. At the end of the day, he goes home. He gets up the next day. He comes back. Why? He's got more work to do. There's more sin. Got more work to do. But see what Jesus did. Offered a single sacrifice for all time. What did he do? He went to heaven and he sat down. Why? His work's done. What are you doing work's over? You sit down. There is no longer needed any work to pay for our sins. So for all those years, all those days, all those weeks, all those animals, they weren't paying for a single sin. But the Bible tells us that they were paying forward our sins, that our sins were accumulating, and God was looking over the sins committed beforehand, and that they were being paid forward, and that they were going forward and moving forward, and that symbolically they were transferred from lamb to lamb to lamb, from sacrifice to sacrifice, from substitution to substitution, until the substitution came. And then in that moment, it wasn't symbolic. In that moment, it wasn't a ritual. In that moment, the real deal took place. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. As all the sins of humanity were placed on that one human being, Jesus Christ, and the wrath of God was poured out on that sin. And he was punished for our sins. And he was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And God punished him. And God killed Jesus so that he would not have to kill us. Jesus took our place. 2,000 years ago, just as God had determined. 1 John 2, 2 tells us this, that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That word propitiation is a big Bible word, but it means sin sacrifice. He was our sin sacrifice. He was the one who took our place. In fact, that same word that's translated propitiation in our New Testament is translated in the Greek version of the Old Testament as Day of Atonement. So John's saying, what happened on the Day of Atonement when that lamb paid for the sins of the people? That was just pointing forward to Jesus. And Jesus is our propitiation. He paid for the sins of the people of God. He is the ram caught in the thicket when God's people, their life was on the line, their life was about to be taken, their life was about to be destroyed, and every promise that God had made was about to die with him. There was a substitute when God's people faced certain destruction from the firstborn of every family dying. There was a substitute when God's people sinned and turned their back on Him. And they were broken from fellowship. They should have had their life required of them, and they should have been put outside of the camp and separated from the fellowship of the people and separated from the fellowship of God. There was a substitute, and all of those substitutes pointed forward to the substitute Jesus you know the Bible tells us in Genesis 22 that God makes this great statement about Abraham he says don't lay your hand on the boy for now I see that you have not withheld from me your son your only son now if you know your Bible history or if you read through the Bible if you start in Genesis and you read through the book of Genesis 
you get to those statements and you, you, you scratch your head a little bit. You don't want to question God and his word, but you go, why does he keep saying that? Genesis 22, 1, take your son, your only son. And you go, wait a second, he's not his only son. There's Ishmael. He has Ishmael. Ishmael's his son. Take your son, your only son. Now I see that you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Yeah, I get it that Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, but, but, but God, you know that that's not his only son. Why do you keep saying it that way? Now, in one way, Isaac was his only son. He was the son of promise. He was the son through which God was going to accomplish everything. God was very clear about that. He'd been clear about that before. But in another way, in another way, it's his reminder pointing forward to the truth that is taught to us in Romans chapter 8, verse 32, that God did not withhold from us his only son, that God was doing something bigger than Abraham and Isaac could even see in that moment, that God was pointing forward to his only son who he would sacrifice. The knife would come down. The altar would be set on fire. The blood would spill. The sacrifice would be made. The real substitute would be sacrificed. You know, we can't say for certain where this mountain was that Abraham was taken to by God. It's a three-day journey to the region of Moriah. Now, we do know that Moriah is Jerusalem. Uh, the Bible's clear about that. Historically, we know that. The region of Moriah is Jerusalem. And we also know there are some mountains in Jerusalem. There's one mountain, the Temple Mount. That's where all the sacrifices were offered until the temple was destroyed, uh, just after the time of Jesus. And so Jewish people say, well, that's where Isaac was offered up as a sacrifice. And by the way, Muslims believe this took place, but they believe it was Ishmael who was offered and not Isaac. And so if you know anything, if you've heard of the Dome of the Rock, then, then that rock that they built a dome around is actually the rock that they believe that Isaac or that Ishmael was laid on top of, and they believe it took place right there on the Temple Mount. It's why the Temple Mount is the site of the Dome of the Rock. It's why there's so much tension over that little small piece of land there in the Middle East in Israel. But there's another mountain in Jerusalem, and it's outside of the city. You have to go outside of the city proper, you have to go outside of the gate, you have to go through a valley, and you have to go up to another mountain. And that mountain is Calvary. And that's the place where Jesus died for our sins. So we can't say for certain that it was that mountain, but there's a really, really good chance that it was. And I like to think about it this way. God didn't take Abraham on a three-day journey to get him a few hundred yards from the very spot where he was going to one day crucify his own son. I believe Abraham was taken on a three-day journey, and Abraham was taken to a mountain, and I believe Abraham was taken to the very spot where Jesus was offered up as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind, so that in that spot, Abraham could stand and say in the deliverance of his own son as a substitute was provided for Isaac, that Abraham could stand and say on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. And then probably Moses adds to that comment, to this day it is said on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. On that mountain that day, God set a pattern of substitution God brought that pattern to its fulfillment in the person and work of Jesus when everything was on the line. God sent a substitute. It's not just about Isaac. This is not just old stories about people wandering around in the desert killing animals. This is about me and you. It's about us here in this room. This is about Christmas. See, that's where we find hope in Christmas. We're not going to find any hope in a well-constructed gingerbread house. We're not going to find any hope in the perfectly decorated tree. We're not going to find any hope in a, a, a gift that's just the right gift for the right person. We're not going to find hope there. And it seems silly to talk about it in this room, but the truth is we all know that many, many people are putting their hope there. They've built up Christmas 2020 as somehow it's going to get us out of the mess we're in. Christmas 2020 and all the trappings around it and all the celebrations and your Christmas lights and your Christmas tree and your Christmas dinner, and I'm sure your turkey's good and I'm sure your ham is good, it has no power to get us out of the mess we're in. But the fact that Jesus Christ took 
our place is a place we can hang our hope and we will not be disappointed. And that's what we're celebrating at Christmas. And so Christmas is coming. And your Christmas plans may not be clear yet, but God's Christmas plans have been clear, not just for 2,000 years, not just for 4,000 years. No, God has planned this before the foundation of the world. And I want you to know something else. God has planned that on this day, you'd be sitting in that seat and you'd hear this message before the foundation of the world. For those of you who are followers of Christ, maybe God has brought you to this seat on this day so that you can adjust your hope, adjust your expectations, and you have no reason to be disappointed in Christmas this year because Christmas will deliver if your Christmas is about Jesus. So maybe God brought you here this day, month and a half out, as you're thinking about your Christmas plans, that they would be centered on Christ so that your hope would not be met with disappointment. Maybe you don't know the Lord. and God brought you to this seat here on this day, planned before the foundation of the world that you'd be here to hear this. That 4,000 years ago, God set in motion this pattern of sacrifice and substitution. And that 2,000 years ago, God brought my sacrifice and my substitution and your sacrifice and your substitution to earth and that he paid the price for our sins he died and he was cut off from fellowship with God so that you and I would not have to face death and we would not have to be cut off from fellowship with God and maybe you're here today and for the first time it's clicked for you that God sent Jesus to die in your place if that's you I want to encourage you to take a step of faith in just a moment when we sing to step out from where you are and come forward if you're watching this online I want to encourage you click on that connect card let us know that God's working in your life reach out to one of our pastors send us an email reach out to a Christian friend that you might know who can help you process what God is doing in your heart God did not spare his own son but he gave him up for us all would you pray with me father thank you for your word thank you for the beauty of your plan Thank you, God, that you love us enough not only to plan what you're going to do through Jesus, but to bring your plan to fulfillment. And, Lord, to bring us all here today to celebrate that, to sing about that, to hear about that. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us through Jesus. Would you move and work in the hearts of those who are here today? Would you do your work as only you can? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand as we sing.